right welcome here. to the 42nd episode of the smartest people in the room if you've been following this series you know what we are doing shining a light on incredibly smart accomplished people and asking them to share stories from their careers and lives as well as anecdotes about their past present and future today i am pleased to welcome two incredibly talented and accomplished guests and we have a lot to thank both of them for I got so fired up talking to these guys yesterday, I could hardly sleep last night. So you guys are in for a treat today. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Some of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. By definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview. I wanna thank our sponsors, First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmasters brand of CBD products. So let's get down to business. Today's interview is, interviewer is my good friend, Bart Herbison. Songwriters have no better friend than Bart. He's executive director of the NSAI, the Nashville Songwriters Association International, the world's largest nonprofit songwriters trade organization and advocacy group dedicated to the songwriting profession. Among many huge accomplishments under Bart's leadership, these three stand out. Adoption of the Music Modernization Act in 2018, the most important copyright law reform for songwriters in decades. The creation of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, and also leading the NSA involvement in the 2016 copy royalty, Copyright Royalty Board trial that led to a historic 44% mechanical royalty increase for American songwriters. I can go on and on and on, but it would, be, it would leave no time to talk about hmm. the focal point of today's smartest people in the room, and that is Jim Peterick. Jim is a survivor. Those words were prophetically spoken first on the back of his first solo album, Don't Fight the Feeling, back in the 70s. In the decades since, Jim has lived up to that term. For over 55 years, he's been the driving force of the Ides of March. Their timeless hit, Vehicle, is played daily all over the world, and their live show remains a juggernaut featuring all of the original members. In the 70s, Jim combined his love for melody and driving rock in the band Survivor. Their phenomenal rise to the top was born on the back of the amazing songs that Jim co-wrote. The Eye of the Tiger from the Rocky Three theme has become an indelible classic and garnered Jim Grammy and People's Choice Awards, as well as an Oscar nomination. Other Billboard chart toppers followed. The Search is Over, High on You, and I Can't Hold Back. Further hits from films followed too. Burning Heart from Rocky IV topped the charts and Jim co-wrote the theme for the seminal emanation hit Heavy Metal with Sammy Hagar. A long lasting and fruitful relationship in 1980, or began in 1980 between Jim and the Southern rock group 38 Special. Jim co-wrote their platinum hits, Hold On Loosely, Caught Up In You, Wild Eyed Southern Boys, Fantasy Girl, Rockin' Into The Night. Jim, I just gotta tell you, I made out to more, with more girls to those songs. I can't thank you enough. You're welcome. <laughs> Their collaboration <laughs> continues to this day. Jim has also written with the beloved Leonard Skinner. Jim Peterick has never lost a verve for style of music that he helped forge, namely melodic rock. His group Pride of Lions tours the European continent regularly and their albums and DVDs are bestsellers. Pride of Lions, the new album Lionheart was released in October of 20 on Frontier Records, Frontiers Records. Expanding from the musical realm in 2002, Jim co-authored the best-selling book, Songwriting for Dummies. This book distilled a lifetime of successful songwriting into simple language and shed light on some of the arcane wisdom of writing songs. In September 2014, Jim's autobiography, Through the Eye of the Tiger, was released. 
The book traces Jim's path from humble beginnings in suburban Chicago to his stellar career as a platinum hit songwriter, successful musician, and in-demand producer. In 2016, he released The Songs, taking his top hits to Nashville in an entirely new light, working with some of Music City's greatest. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Bart Herbison and Jim Peterick to the smartest people in the room. Take it away, Bart. Wow, Tom, thank you. Jimbo, how you doing, man? Dude, man, I want to meet this guy. <laughs> He's oh. amazing. Oh, man, I, I tell you, thank you, Tom, for that uh, illustrious introduction, man. I'm, thank you. That's all I can say. Thank well, you. Jimbo, I love you, man. Always good to see you. Ides of March, you were kids. You were, you were kids. How did the group get together? Yeah, you know, we didn't know we were kids, though. That was, that was the thing, you know. <laughs> we just, well, look, uh, we were just uh, in the school band together. You know, I played saxophone, Larry played the cymbals, Bob played the clarinet, Mike played the drums. We were all in the same uh, marching band, making formations in the middle of the football games, and all the cheerleaders laughing at us because we weren't jocks like the, we should have been. But that's where we met in school. And... Um, and all of a sudden, you know, I put a band together that really sucked called the Renegades. And uh, we played for the 4th of July and Larry and Bob were in the audience. And uh, pretty soon Larry was knocking on my door and says, you know, your band stinks. They didn't say sucked in those days. <laughs> your band stinks. Uh, and my band's better. I said, yeah, right. Well, he kept on me. I finally went over there and I auditioned, I auditioned for the Shondells. Of course, we had to change our name because Tommy James and the Shondells came up with Hanky Panky. And uh, we were just about to put together, uh, put out our first release, You Wouldn't Listen, on the Parrot label. And we're scrambling for uh, names in Bob Berger. We're all uh, reading Julius Caesar in senior, uh, senior literature. And Bob goes, beware the Ides of March. Sounds like a name. And we became the Ides of March. That song uh, came out and went to number one. And oh my God. The rest is history. <laughs> well, I hate it for anybody that tunes in late because I want everybody to stop what you're doing. Literally, I'm going to do the bluebird thing. Shh. And I want you to hear, and they're going to go really hyperbole. You tell me after you hear the greatest story behind this song I've ever heard. I'm privileged to get to do that series for the Gannett newspaper chain. We just passed 250 episodes. Not a single one touches this one you're in a concert line you're going to see a show take it from there wow gee no build up on that story <laughs> wow uh yeah so you know i was a huge turtles fan and when i heard the turtles were coming to a local high school i just about fainted you know Flo and eddie chris they didn't call themselves that yet you know but uh i was too chicken to ask this one girl in high school because, believe it or not, I was very shy in those days. That, that changed. You're how old? Uh, right? yeah. How old are you? I, I, was, uh, I was 16. Uh, so I, um, I, I'm standing in line with my pea coat, and this gaggle of girls come in. A gaggle is like four or more hot chicks. And they were all wearing their, their really collegiate kind of things, and they were all cuter than the next one. But there was one girl that just caught my eye, and she had on orange culottes, knee socks, and saddle shoes. X-rated innocence to all the way. And I just kept looking at her. You know, I, I said, well, this girl is out of my league. She'll never talk to me. Just then she turns around and says, aren't you Peterick? I go, yeah, there is a God. <laughs> And she said, I just saw the Ides of March. You opened up for, uh, for the New Colony 6. You guys were great. And I'm like, oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and we started talking. And we're standing in line to see the turtles. She came in from a, a Catholic high school. I came in from my high school. And we started talking. And we never stopped. And pretty soon the doors opened. It was first come, first serve. serve. And we went into those doors. And... We picked out seats four rows back, and she said, no, you got to sit here, Jim. And I go, okay, all right. <laughs> so I, I'm sitting next to Miss Kulats, you know, and Flo and Eddie are up there, and they're rocking. 
And uh, they started doing Happy Together. Right in the middle of that, little Miss Kulats put her leg on top of my leg. And I'm looking around to see if anybody's seeing this. And her girlfriend says, Karen, what are you doing? And Karen says, it's all right. I trust him. Oh, my God. <laughs> so that lasted for a good long 30 seconds. I was in heaven. Anyway, concert's over, and uh, I get to walk her home uh, to her girlfriend's house. My, my uh, 1964. Well, I think you, you were going to drive her home, but she wasn't having that. Right? Well, she wasn't having that. You know, I, I had my 64 Valiant parked outside, uh, but she said, no, my, my father told me, you know, no rides with strangers. So I walked her home, and uh, I said, I'll call her in, in five days. Well, I chickened out, and it turned out to be a good thing because she had to wait an extra weekend, and when I finally called her, I, I finally figured out the hook of how to approach her. I said, I was so nervous last week to talk to you that I couldn't even call you. Guys, if you ever need an excuse, you're too nervous. <laughs> You're vulnerable. She loved it. Anyway, she bought it, and uh, we we um, she invited me over to her house. I came with my guitar, of course. She was in Berwyn, Illinois, and that was my hometown too. And I walked in with my guitar, and her dad says, "Get out." And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "He said, well, we're we're leaving, and you're not going to be home alone with with my my girl." So I took my guitar case and left. <laughs> And I, I never did get to, to play her a song in, in, in the living room, but that was just a false start. And a couple of days later, we went to see a, a, play, uh, a play at Morton uh, High School. And we stopped on the way back home in back of Larry Millis's house in the alley. And she gave me my first real kiss. I mean, I was 17 by that time. She was only 15, but I had never really kissed. You know, it was like, you know, that kind of kiss. Well, she really gave me a kiss, and it was like, whoa, is that what they're talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like this. So anyway, we were a, we were a couple for the next eight months, and uh, we went to see plays and uh, shows and r great restaurants. She had her first lobster because uh, I told her it was great. She's, oh, my God. So I taught her a few things about, about uh, food and culinary things, and... Uh, Anyway, we went to the beach one day, and I have a tendency to break out when I get too much sun. So there I am, white as a ghost, and I break out in hives. It was not a pretty sight, and we didn't have a very good time at all, because then I got diarrhea, uh, because of all the apple cider we were drinking. So it was not a, not a banner day for, for Jimmy Peterick. And uh, so anyway, I drive her home, and I, she, she said, uh, I, thanks, Jim. I had a great time, I think. And I go, oh, shit. Oh, I think was the kiss of death. The next day she called me and said, it's off. I want to I date other guys. I love you, but not in that way. Oh. That is the kiss of death, guys. Mm -hmm. If you hear that. You know, I, said, wah, wah. Wah, wah. I said, there's only one way, you know. Anyway, so... The eyes go on the road because we had a minor hit in 66 called You Wouldn't Listen. And I'm like, hard to live with. I want to play the blues. I don't want to play, you know, our, our perky songs, right? And uh, anyway, I, we got through the tour and I came home and guess who calls me? Little Miss Kulats. And, and she says, well, hi, Jim. It's not a date, but you got that cool Valiant and I need a ride to modeling school. Can you take me? I said, Absolutely, you know, no pride, no pride at all. I figure if I could get <laughs> near her, that's one step closer to her. So I take her to, to uh, Patricia Stevens Modeling School in, in uh, Oak Park, and I drop her off, wait in the parking lot for an hour and a half. She comes out, oh, that was good, thanks, Jim, take her home. I figured at the door she would give me a peck on the cheek, nothing, shook my hand, left. I go, okay. Well, that started happening. Like every week, I'm taking her to Patricia Stevens Modeling School, <laughs> and I'm getting a little bit, you know, steamed. And I, I, I remember saying to myself, you know, did she pay I, for the gas, Jim? Yeah, well, she paid for the gas. That's <laughs> true. That is true. But uh, I got this idea. I said, all I am is her chauffeur. All I am is her limousine service. And then, you know, the, the heavens open. I said, all I am is her vehicle, baby. <laughs> and 
<laughs> so about that word vehicle, the V and everything, I said, that is, I knew a hook then, I know, I know a hook now. That's an amazing word. And I heard from the heavens again, they opened up and I heard ba da ba ba da <laughs> It was like a call to arms, you know, charge! So uh, I called the rehearsal and we went to Larry's basement where we always rehearsed. And, and I showed, them the, the, uh, showed the guys the songs, we worked it out. But I still didn't know what that first line was going to be, because you know, Bart, the first line, the hook, right away, you got to get them right mm -hmm. away. And I had this really lame line, I got a set of wheels, pretty baby, won't you hop inside my car? Oh, yeah, set of wheels, pretty baby. Well, I'm, sit I'm sitting in, in biology class with Bill Greiner, the biggest stoner in Morton West. <laughs> and uh, and he, he came totally baked one day, he's always baked. And uh, it's just Bacoli, basically. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> so he shows me this brochure that he had just got somewhere, and it was an anti drug uh, brochure. And you open it up, and there's this little cartoon of the friendly stranger. It's this really corny, uh, you know, cartoon. There's a black sedan, and this opening the door and luring the kid in, you know. And I, I said, that's really, really cool. And, and I, all of a sudden I just heard, I'm a friend, the stranger in the black sedan, won't you hop inside my car? You know, holy crap, that's the hook, man. So next rehearsal, I had it all together, man. And the, the brass guys, man, we worked out this arrangement. I got goosebumps and little Tommy from down the block came over and he's like, this is a smash, this is a smash. Well, guess what? We go into the studio with our producers, Frank Brand and Bob Bustaki, and in two, two takes, we caught lightning in a bottle. But there's, there was a little flag on that play mm -hmm. because we were about to leave the studio and the second engineer goes, we have a little problem. We erased 30 seconds of the master tape. And we go, oh shit, oh shit. Well, let me ask you that, which 30 seconds? It went from the end of the second course all the way to the lead part. It stopped at the lead part. Thank God. Oh, okay. I, will never, I would never play that guitar solo again that way. It was better than I could play. I don't know what I did. I couldn't hear myself. But that was the thir 13 mm -hmm. seconds. And I, the Ides of March hit the streets. We're, we're on Rush Street going, oh, no, we're over. Well, Larry stayed there because Larry's the, the tech guy. He's the... Uh, Guy with, and by the way, shout out to Larry, who's here with us today. So. Oh, yeah, Larry Millis. I've known him since third grade, my best friend and uh, my tech and my co-writer sometimes and producer and amazing, amazing guy. Anyway, he stayed there and there was a take one. Thank God. Now, there was no click track in those days, Bart. It was just all feel. Mm -hmm. So the odds of something from take one matching up to take two are like infinitesimal. So they tried, while I was gone <laughs> and uh, eating a pastrami sandwich, they cut 13 seconds from take one, slide it into take two. We come there, everybody's smiling. Listen to this. Perfect. It was effing perfect. All I had to do is re-sing that area. Well, that's why I ask you which 30 seconds. If it had been five seconds before, after any other part of the song, you couldn't have done it. No. It was, it was meant to be, it was ordained to be a big hit. So uh, we mixed it and you know what? It was the fastest added record in Warner Brothers history. In two weeks, we we're on the whole chain, the whole Drake chain uh, of stations. We're going, holy mackerel. We're watching it fly up the billboard charts all the way to number two, number one on the cash box. Damn it, we were held out by No Sugar Tonight by the Guess Who. An American, I mean, American woman, flip side, no sugar tonight. Oh my God, at least we were held out by a great song. But I, one time I, I ran into Randy Bachman, I told him about that. He said, oh man, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's as far as it went at that point. And, but when that record came out, you know, Little Miss Kulatz heard it on the radio and I was done with the tour. She starts calling me. And she said, you know, Jim, maybe I, I was a little hasty, you know, about, you know, just, you know, dropping you like that. And, um, you know, maybe we should think about 
doing it again, you know? Well, I, man, this is really cool. I didn't tell you this part, <laughs> but I said, well, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to Florida with my family for a week. Let me think about it. Let me think about it because I got another girlfriend now. Remember that, guys. Tom, <laughs> another girlfriend. That, that drives me crazy. And I did. I had another girlfriend that looked like Karen, but she was not Karen. And, you know, it's the personality. It's the heart. It's not the nose and the boobs and all that stuff. <laughs> Although that helps. But anyway, she said, okay, okay. So I got home from, from Florida. All the while in Florida, I'm going, I got her. I got her. You know, so I come home and I, and I called Karen. I said, so what's going on? She said, well, I was thinking that maybe I was a little hasty. Maybe we should try it again. I let her hang on that phone for four seconds. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'll pick you up right now. <laughs> and we started dating and we were just having a blast. We loved all the same foods. We ate lobster again. Uh, and we went to we went to this revolving uh, restaurant called the Pinnacle. I was showing her stuff that she had never seen before because, you know, I'm a rock star now, right? <laughs> I, knew, I knew all the ropes. So then we started. Uh, we went to this amazing ice cream place in in Oak in Oak Park uh, called Happiness Is, and you would sit in these carriages, and just the world would go away on butterfat and hot fudge, you know. And that's when she said, you know, maybe we should get engaged. So uh, we get engaged, we started making wedding plans, and I'll tell you what, our song is still happy together. And 48 years later, I'm still her vehicle. <laughs> and uh, I love her, love her to bits, man. And uh, I'm still that guy with the funny hair, although it wasn't purple in those days. <laughs> but we've been a great team together. Now we have two grandkids fr from our son, Colin, and it all started with, aren't you Peter Rick? <laughs> <laughs> so Ives, again, your your kids, I mean, you're teenagers and you you tour with everybody and you play open as an opening, uh, as a closing act too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, 71 vehicle was, you know, top 10. We were on the road with uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, the big one, of course, was uh, Janis Joplin, we toured with her. We toured with Led Zeppelin, even bigger than Joplin. Although I got to walk Janis Joplin home because she was too stoned. And I knew she was staying at our hotel. So arm in arm, we walked down. This was in Winnipeg. And I was a, I was a perfect gentleman. Uh, and I let, let her off at her room and uh, went to my room. But these, these are the memories you know, we, we love. We, we toured with the Grateful Dead, couldn't stand them. Uh, they ate all of our deli trays. So, you know, I mean, leave something for us. <laughs> By the way, um, our friend Jim Griffin here says uh, he hasn't heard the word culottes in 30 years and heard it four or five times. In ah, <laughs> I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> yeah, I bet you they, were, they were sexy, kind of. So um, a lot to cover. We'll move off of Ives for a minute and Oh, did you want to hear that song part or no? Oh, well, of course. Uh, my bad. Let's let me turn this off. I mean, would I'll, you please play it for me? I'll just do kind of an abbreviated version of it uh, without the lead part because it sounds like crap on, a, on acoustic guitar. But all you people out there, and I'm sure there's at least 15 or 20 of you out there watching and listening. When I count to two, I want you to do the most famous horn riff in horn riff history. Can you help me out? Yes. That's good. Okay. One, two. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -da. And then it goes on to say, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Hey, well, I'm the friend of stranger in the black sedan. I want you to hop inside my car. I got pictures, got candy, I'm a lovable man, and I can take you to the nearest stop. I'm your vehicle, baby. Take you anywhere you wanna go. I'm your vehicle, woman. And by now I'm sure you know that I love you. I need you. I want you. Got to help you, child. Great God in heaven, you know I love you. Da -ba -da. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Well, well, if you want to be a movie star. Take it to Hollywood. 
But if you won't stay just like you are, you know I think you really should. I'm your vehicle, baby. Take it anywhere you wanna go. I'm your vehicle, woman. But now I'll show you know that I love you, I need you, I want you, got to help you, child. Great God in heaven, you know I love, love you. Whoa. Two. Wow, Jimbo. <laughs> you know, uh, I should say here, too, um, a mutual friend. Were you watching American Idol the night Bo Bice first did that song? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Here's my little story there. I was in Nashville, you know, writing with some great writers. And uh, I went into the elevator at the Embassy Suites and... Uh, and uh, it was this glass, kind of a weird glass elevator. As I'm going down, I get this frantic call from uh, my drummer from the Ides of March. I said, what's going on? He said, get up to your room. There's this guy, he looks like Jesus Christ, and he's singing the shit out of vehicle. I said, no. And he did, man. He oh my God, wow. he crushed it. So I ran upstairs to the room, turn it on, I caught at least the last third of, of the... Uh, of the song and I had goosebumps all over. I mean, he did look like Jesus Christ, uh, uh, but he sounded great. And uh, I was so happy and I, I called him, I, I found, got his number and uh, we started being friends and the rest is history. We, we write together and we perform together and Bo Bice is a force of nature. A couple comments I should insert here before we move on, Michelle Shock. Uh, rock star in her own right jim you missed your chance to get your head on a big brass bed she typed that in on the janice joplin part oh this is lyrics um, oh. <laughs> mr mojo i don't you may know mr mojo karen is such a wonderful person and your kids are so incredible just one of the nicest families i've ever known especially in this bit that's so nice that's so nice michelle shock oh my god a fan yeah. of her so right oh that's awesome um so the next big musical incarnation is the group Survivor. How did that come together? Wow. Well, I, I was. And on... why weren't you the singer, by the way? Let's oh, talk about okay. Oh you, oh, you want to open a can of worms right now? You want to <laughs> no. do that? Yeah. You really want to do that? <laughs> no, we'll move on. But I'm okay. just saying, y'all you, you you auditioned for a singer, right? I, 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 we did. So this is brand new. This is a double album in red. This is on Volcano Label. I just wanted to plug this because I just got my copy. Look at this red label. It's um, the greatest hits of Survivor. And there's me, Frankie, Dave Bickler, Mark Jubay, the late Stefan Ellis, Frankie Sullivan, Mark Jubay again. Oh, there's doubles of us. Okay, I get mm -hmm. it. Me. Uh, and then on the front is the incarnation with uh, Jimmy Jameson, one of the greatest singers, the late mm -hmm. Jimmy Jameson of, of all time. Uh, the search is over. Probably one of my greatest power ballads, but it wouldn't be what it is without Jimmy's delivery. You know, just huh, the girls' pants just fell off of them at, at that at that point. It's just ridiculous. Oh, another another neat thing. Um, what was the question? I, I got. Well, I was just really. How did the band? How did you assemble the band? How did the band come okay. together? Is my, okay. really my question. That's what it is. So. I was on the road as a solo artist promoting my solo album, Don't Fight the Feeling, which Tom mentioned, which might, might be the only person in the world that knows about the album, but knows a few people. But, uh, and uh, I was recuperating from pneumonia because I was touring too hard and singing too hard. And so I was high on codeine and nurses beating my chest, you know, it was kind of a lot of fun. But all of a sudden I had this grand design, I'm gonna to put together the greatest rock band of all times. You know, Codeine can do that to, to a person. And I started making a list of you know, like favorite people. Rhythm section, Dennis Johnson and, and Keith, uh, uh, and Dennis Johnson and- Gary Smith. Gary Smith, thank you. Uh, the rhythm section for the group Chase, which uh, I did songwriting and touring with, and they were just amazing. By the way, that band played a drive-in movie theater in my little hometown, Paris, Tennessee. Are you Skyview Drive-In. Remember Rick Conger sent us some pictures. Oh my God, that is cool. Well, they were a great live band and, and unfortunately most of the band went down in a DC-3 uh, crash, the same 
plane that the Ides of March used to rent with the same pilot. But um, at, so I'm putting together my wish list of the of the perfect band, and I had been doing jingles to support my habit of of demos for my songs. That's the only habit I ever had, really. And uh, there was this great singer that was across the mic doing the friendly skies of your land, United Airlines. His name was Dave Bickler. And uh, he used to sit in the corner between takes and, and read sci-fi uh, books. i never forget that. He was a sci-fi freak. And uh, so he was on my list. And then what about guitar? And I had just seen this band called Mariah. In fact, their producer, Bob Destocki, took three of my songs uh, and they put it on the first album for United Artists. And I went to see Mariah and Frankie is all over the stage, an amazing guitar player, killing it. So I put him down. So there, there's the band, right? And I started calling people. Everybody was into the idea. We had a big powwow and we created the Jim Peterick band. And at that point, Bart, I was co-singing everything with Dave mm -hmm. Bickler. But, um, you know, Frankie was very persuasive, shall we say, uh, and he would say more walking out of a room than coming into it, okay? So that's just a, a little uh, snapshot of Frankie Sullivan. Anyway, uh, I mean, we had a great lead singer, and at that point I went from guitar and, and switched to keyboards, which is kind of a good thing because some of my best songs were written on piano, which was really my first instrument. So that's how that came about. And we auditioned for John Kladner, the famous bearded, weird guy with the white suit in the pump video uh, with Aerosmith. He signed Aerosmith and uh, so many other great groups. You know, Sammy Hagar. He came out to see us at SIR in Chicago and uh, he loved the demo tape. It had a thing called Somewhere in America, which was on our very first album. But there's. I kept saying, Frankie, we need one more song. He said, ah, we got enough. I said, no, we need one more. And I wrote a song called 2020. And the year is 2020, which is kind of cool. And we played it for Collider. He said, that's the one. And we played it six times in a row. That song got us signed. He took us over to, uh, to Nick's Fish Market and wined and dined us with the best steaks and you know, champagne, the whole bit. And suddenly we were on Scotty Brothers because... Um, this is a budding new label that Kaladner uh, was a and r for. And uh, suddenly we're on tour with uh, some of the greatest bands of all, of all time, like Triumph and Ario Speedwagon and so many others. We're going to pick up some more of that later on. But look, I want to compliment you, Jim. It's always been amazing to me. I mean, there's some similarity of, of the sounds in those areas, but it's two. You had success with two very different groups. You changing instruments, hmm. something people don't do, so congrats. But Thank you. I want to I go to the present time because I literally do not know of a single individual that's taken this crazy pandemic as more of an opportunity than you have. You've turned a challenge into an opportunity, so I'm just going to throw some names out here and some other things. Tell us what you're up to. And Tom and I yesterday are like, when you start naming these names, Brian Wilson. Yeah. Well, that's a real success story. I mean, for me to be writing with Brian is like me writing with Paul McCartney. It's the same strata. I agree. When the Ides were uh, young, it was Burt Bacharach, Brian Wilson, and the Beatles. They were all on the same par, you know. And uh, I tell you, I, I was just, just very, very fortunate. Joe Thomas, uh, Brian's producer, Big fan of mine, a good friend of Larry's. We got together in, in uh, was it uh, two, 99, 2099, and we uh, collaborated on an album called, my, uh, called Imagination. And I had two songs on that album, and that sold, you know, a lot of, a lot of copies. But it forged the friendship between me and Brian. And around 2010, we all got together for dinner at a, at a Chinese place. And uh, we're talking about AM radio, and Brian is like, yeah, nothing sounded like a, a hit record coming out of an AM radio. And he said, that's why God made the radio. And I go, there's the hook. There's the hook. He didn't even know he said it. I said, Brian, did you hear what you just said? He says, no, you know what? No, that's why God made the radio. Over the next year and a half, we wrote the song. 
came out in 2012, and it, it went to number one on the charts. And uh, every show they did, whether it's is Leno or, or uh, you know, the Tonight Show with, with David Letterman, on and on, they played That's Why God Made the Radio. And uh, I went to see them with my son Colin and my wife uh, Karen, Little Miss Kulats, <laughs> and we're sitting in the third row, and they're doing That's Why God Made the Radio. And this was like, in 2012, I didn't still think I could have moments like that. And mm -hmm. goes, you, this must be a really big moment for you. I said, yeah, this is like one of, the, one of the biggest, to be writing and enjoying Brian Wilson on one of my songs. So now we're doing it again, and we're, we're writing for his new album. So fun, fun. Dennis DeYoung, you, babe. Come on, <laughs> He's amazing. The funny thing was, we were kind of, rivals but friendly rivals for years he was in sticks they're right in the charts i'm in oh, are they out of chicago area? they are, yeah, they are. oh yeah south, yeah south side yeah uh and we were riding the charts they were riding the charts they were touring we were touring they were amazing they toured a lot more than we did you know they although we went all over the world and they stayed stayed in north america but uh we always had this kind of friendly rivalry. Well, my song's number two. Well, my song's number five, but it's going up, you know. <laughs> so it was just always fun. And we had tried to write together about 15 years ago, you know, and sometimes things don't click. And we didn't have the formula right, but we remained friends. And we went out to dinner with my wife and his wife and got to know each other even better. And about three years ago, I had this brainstorm. I said, Dennis, you're just you're touring, you're doing great, you're selling tickets, but the world needs your music. And he's like, oh, nobody buys records anymore. What is a record? You know, this real down thing, you know? And I said, well, that may be true, but when you were 15, you weren't thinking about selling records. You were thinking about impressing that girl with the culottes. Mm -hmm. You were thinking about doing what God gave you to do, which is the musical gene. And he goes, hmm, okay. So I was in Europe doing a, doing a concert, and I was walking through a graveyard because I love writing songs in, in graveyards. And I wrote this, this germ of a song called Run for the Roses. And, um, and it, it was amazing, I have to say, it was amazing. And I taped it on my little iPhone and I sent it to Dennis. He said, this is the start of our album. Yeah. That did it. And uh, that was part one, came out in uh, a few months ago. And now part two, we're working on that. <laughs> Very honored to be working with Dennis, one of my heroes. Well, that's a big year. We're done. Now, Chicago? <laughs> but What's wait, up? there's more. Okay. Uh, that's my latest one. In fact, Larry's involved in that as well. Uh, I met Robert Lamb after an Ides of March show. We opened for them about three years ago in New Lenox at, at the outdoor amphitheater. And... Uh, I went up to him and I said, man, you're, you're one of my writing heroes. And I started singing uh, one of their hits, you know, Wake Up Sunshine. And he, you remember that one? Yeah, I remember that one. So we got to be friends and I gave him the new Eyes of March album. He gave me his new Robert Lamb album. And we, we uh, wrote a song, Long Distance. And it really, really came out really well. Uh, but this time we got really serious and we wrote, now we, we've written 11 songs together. And what a pleasure ready for Robert Lamb. It started out to be a Lamb Peterick album, but now it's going to be a Chicago album. Uh, and uh, that's big. So, so Brian Wilson, Dennis DeYoung, Chicago. You know, Jim, it's got to be, it's a testament that other superstars call on you to write or write with you and understand that here's a collaborator that's yeah. some of the parts type thing. You know my favorite collaborations, and I didn't, we didn't plan on doing this, but you want to do a little quick piece of my favorite 238 special songs? Oh, only if you insist and ask me really nice. Please. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. I never knew there'd come a day when I'd be saying to you, don't let this good love slip away Now that we know that it's true Don't, don't you know the kind of man I am Said, said I'd never fall in love again But it's real and the feeling comes shining through Sing along So caught up in you, little girl You're the one that's got me down on my knees so Baby, you taught 
me how good it could be. Your baby needs someone to believe in. And a whole lot of space to breathe in. <laughs> Give me those eighth notes, baby. <laughs> it worked for the cars. You see it all around you. Got the loving going bad. And usually it's too late when you realize what you had. My mind goes back to the girl I met long years ago. Who told me? This You think you didn't sleep last night? <laughs> Come on. I, I need a break. I'm going to go to some questions. Yeah, baby. Boy, boy, from your friend Avi Poster. Still oh, yeah. one of your best moments we've ever had together was during your last 10 Pan South show with Joey Scott. I was there. That was a heck of a night. That was fun. Peggy Dolds talking about um, vehicle. This is an important part of the soundtrack of so many of our lives. Thank you. Oh, nice. That's really nice. Yeah, that's sweet. So the Mojo, you know him just as Mojo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mojo. I got my Mojo working. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not supposed to do any of this, but come on. Terry Workus. Thanks so much, Jim. Dynamite. I was 13 when I first heard Vehicle. A little bit of L.A. Goodbye. Well, my wavelength gets a little longer Every time I wave goodbye Hi, hi Sentimental breakdown You know I break down a lot Hi, hi Where I'm not supposed to lie My Always see myself just below And as I board my plane Something inside my brain Hates to wave And they goodbye And they goodbye Jim, I found clips. This is Terry again. I found clips on YouTube with you with Chase. Yeah. Question here. I don't won't play it. The first tune on the A side for the record, open up wide. Close up tight, the B side. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I wasn't part of the, those songs on that album. It was Boys and Girls Together was my yeah. contribution. Uh Jim Griffin, love Jim. Forest Park, Illinois in the house, he says. All right. Let's see. Uh, well, I wanted to say hi to jo Joey Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about we talked yeah, to Bobby, been... her wonderful husband. Joey and I I'm writing some great songs right and now. And Avi's doing some great charitable work. I oh, love he's, them both. He's a prince. Yep. Uh, that's why God made the radio. Always fascinating to hear a story of what inspired a great song and a songwriter. Um, what, what inspired you on that one quickly? Well, it was, it was Brian's, Brian's title. We you know, that's that. why God made the radio. And, well, thank you. Yeah. It, you know, so. and, and really, I mean, it's, you know, cruising in your, your, in your car, cruising in. What is the lyric? Cruising in your latest star. Tuning in your latest star. Tuning in your latest star. From the dashboard of your car. Meet you at seven. Push button heaven. <laughs> Capturing uh, moonbeams in a jar. Okay. Wow. Amy Lee, thanks you for keeping the language so. Um, and look, well, the first time you ever told me the story about vehicle, I wasn't sure we were going to use it, but you married her. So, <laughs> um, OMG from Olivia, and let's see what else we got here. Hi, Olivia. I'm going to break that bad language. Mark Stone creates a new word. He calls you bad assery. 
and he's correct. Um, and that's, <laughs> I'm going to use that. Yeah, I like it too. Uh, yeah. Goose Bumps from Janice Spain. I know Janice. Um, Carla Lip, Lipman, I'm Dying, Best Songwriter Around Ever. Now, oh. Probably, probably talking about the Tin Pan Show. Um, that, that, was, that was, I love those Tin Pan Shows, man. I'll tell you. Michelle, again, classic. Um, High from the Extremes from Sue's. Uh, the extreme fans are, are, are legions that follow us everywhere. Uh, that one time we were in, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and this yellow school bus pulls up, and 30 extreme fans pull out with their, their yellow Ides of March t shirts. And we go, oh, oh, it was really the coolest. Cheryl Santucci, hey, Jim, uh, Cheryl Santucci, Gina's mom. Oh, yeah. I'm working, but she took her lunch hour to watch this. Oh, uh, thank you. I think we've answered this. And what kind of projects are you currently working? We've an answered a lot about this. What about Jerry? I don't know about this story on about 2009 on Jerry Springer. Oh, man. Yeah, I got a friend of mine who owns a guitar shop, friends with Jerry Springer, and uh, wanted to know if I wanted to be on the show on stage with Jerry. I said, of course, you know. Uh, and it turned out to be his last show in Chicago. And I was like a bouncer, you know. And I remember I got to officiate a, a gay wedding. It was just the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. And people always bring it up because it was so off the wall and out of character for what I do. All right. We're going to hit a lot of topics quickly. I didn't know this either yesterday. First of all, your son, Colin Peter. Hmm. And... I didn't know he was in the top Steely Dan tribute band. You have to be a heck of a musician to even really, I'm going to go, really? Donald Fagan, seriously? Walter, yeah, I, seriously? Yeah, I mean, these aren't just kids playing around. It's, uh, they've got it down. Uh, Colin Peterick is, is the Donald Fagan, both on keyboards and vocals. You close your eyes and, and it's Fagan. A lot better looking. No offense, Donald, but uh, <laughs> well, I don't think Fagan ever. That's not his claim. To he doesn't have an ego <laughs> on that that thing. But what a songwriter! And anyway, Brooklyn Charmers are amazing. I go to see them. Uh, well, not this year so much, but uh, all across America they tour, and uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, he's writing too, Colin. Yes, he is. Your newest record, Play On. There you go. Talk to us. Yeah, um, Ides of March recorded that last year in, in 2019. And we said, we got to make this the Ides of March's best album. You know, the Vehicle album was great. That was 1970, and we had three more after that. But I said, that was the 70s. We got to crush it. So uh, I, we talked about it. We said, we need a producer because, you know, I, I'm pretty strong personality, and, and I think every song I write is the best one I've ever written, even if it's not. <laughs> so we hired Fred Mullen, who's a wonderful guy, lives in Nashville. He's actually from uh, Toronto. And one of the best producers in the United States. Oh, my God. So, so good. And he turns out to be a huge Ides of March fan. He and Paul Schaefer uh, would be on the phone with us, you know, reminiscing. And Paul Schaefer's a, a huge <coughs> Ides of March fan as well. We played in Thunder Bay, and guess who was in the audience? A young, young Paul Schaefer. He, he tells me about that all the time, that we were really good, and good to hear that. But Fred was really hard on us, and we played him, must have played him 30 songs, and he chopped it down to, to 14. And although I was really PO'd at the elimination of one song, in retrospect, he was right. And we, we cut the best album we've cut. Oh, I can't hear you for some reason. You need to unmute. You have a new charitable organization, Jim. Yes. And, I, and before you even talk about that, you're such a giver. Every single time I've called on you, and I'm going to tell a story about that in a minute, you said yes. And you are a serious, serious mentor to young songwriters and artists. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I, li I, I remember when I was 13, just a few words from a, uh, from a songwriter that, well, like, well, I won't mention any names, but in Chicago, there's a few that never really made it. They were great songwriters, and they liked my writing and met, met the world to me. So I try to be that that mentor. Um, and uh, what was the question? Your new charitable organization. That's good. Okay, thank you. 
I was reminiscing about those days. Uh, it's called a vehicle for education. And a what for education? Uh, ba -da -ba -ba -da, <laughs> a vehicle for education. What a hook. And it's been around for about six years now. We've uh, raised a lot of money and we've granted a lot of scholarships every year. Uh, we, we don't actually choose the person. Uh, Morton uh, West uh, was our alma mater. We, we trust uh, one of the, the principals at that school and he hasn't disappointed us yet. Every year he delivers us a great male or female. It could be a singer, a songwriter, it could be a trombone player, a sax player. Uh, but every year the, the prize gets richer. And uh, I'll tell you, we brought some of these people on stage with us and that's the thrill of their life. You know, to be playing for, you know, 5,000 people and this one especially girl, with something you orchestrated well yeah and but for the kid you know playing the trombone on vehicle and crushing it that's going to change his life you know so that's what this organization is all about and i know when i first called you after COVID hit you were doing stuff for music cares you you really do um, give back to the community I and mean, I, I thank you for that um you got a christmas show coming up yes we do uh it's going to be filmed right here right larry Yes, we're uh, 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 in rehearsal for the Christmas show. Yeah, but it, it, the, the, the actual show is going to be us like at a rehearsal. Wow. Yeah. And the, the joking that we're just going to totally be ourselves. And of course, the sound will be great. We're mucking up everything. But I think it's going to be a, a really inside peak. And of course, it'll be all uh, Christmas content, all things that we've written through the years for, for, for Christmas. Uh, so, you know, standards are great, but we actually are blessed to have, you know, sharing Christmas. Yeah, we have really some really good songs. Let me go to the crowd. Um, hey, from Margie Evans. Hey, Margie, how are you doing? Uh, Alexander, what's Alexander's last name here? Alexander, I can't, good, Godman. And I don't know which story he was talking about. I think it applies to all of them. He goes, that's like crazy. <laughs> um, the, 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 shocked the, again. Generosity of spirit. Amen. Oh, man. No truer words ever spoken. By the way, the, the vehicle foundation is there's a link that Mr. Truett posted here uh, from Hey to Larry from Sue's. Am I pronouncing this right? Spimantana? Spatana? Sue Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jim Griffin, and then we're gonna we're gonna close this out in a minute with another long story. Uh, well, actually, have you been co-writing Michelle Harris asked during the pandemic remotely? And how does that work for you? How's the Zoom thing for you? Um, you know, it works. It works. It's not like being there, uh, but I'll tell you what, you can get the job done. Uh, I don't really do Zoom too much, but mm -hmm. it does it does work. You know, mainly. Mm -hmm. I'll do a, a work tape and MP3 it to, you know, Dennis or whoever. And uh, yeah, we don't like seeing each other anyway. I mean, we're all, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it does work. But the chemistry in, in the room itself is always better. All right, let's get one from a resident of that traveling town. Jim Griffin asks, speaking of Chicagoans, thoughts on Jonathan Kane. Jonathan Kane is a genius. Gene E. Us. With By the way, there's an episode, there's a couple of story behind the song yeah. with Jonathan. You need to go check those out at Tennessean.com. Genius. I will. I'm going to give an opinion on this one. Okay. WLX Chicago. <laughs> Larry Lujak. And it was all, for Larry, it was thumbs up or thumb down. You loved him or you hated him? Oh, yeah. What was your opinion? Well, we had a, not a pleasant experience with him. Uh, I mean, now it's water under the dam or whatever that term is. But we had a big hit with Vehicle. And then we were going to put out uh, Air of Good Feeling, which is what the band wanted, what our management wanted. Well, Warner Brothers wanted something that sounds like Vehicle. You know, when the Jackson 5, all their songs sound alike. And uh, so I wrote a song called Superman. And instead of great God in heaven, it was great Caesar's ghost, you know, I love you. It was such a clone. <laughs> I'm embarrassed talking about it. You can't infringe your own copyright, I guess. Uh, well, I know, I know, but I should have. But anyway, it, it made it to the number 50 uh, on Billboard. It was, it was a stiff. But anyway, so Lou Jack premiered it on WLS, and we're waiting, uh, we're 
taking equipment out of a van and and we're listening to Lou Jack. We're about to do one of the wild gooses in, in Chicago in the suburbs. And he goes, you know, this is the new one from the Ides of March. But you tell me, I think it's the same song as Vehicle with different words. You let me know. And he played the song. And we're like, wah, 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 wah. Well, I, I was the other guy's fan. WLS stands for World's Largest Store. Right. It was 89 on your AM radio dial. That's that right. That signal was Clear Channel, went over North America. It was crazy. I was in Paris, Tennessee and got it. Mine was John Records Landecker and Records truly is my middle name. And it was, it was his mother's maiden name. So, because we get asked the question, who's Larry Lujak? He was a DJ that you loved or hated. Mm. Terry worked us again, says, thanks for putting this together. So, uh, nice. I'm gonna tell Jim Peter a story. Oh, geez. Um, before I do that, you and I were talking, and look, one of the great things about NSAI is um, we're an information con. And so a lot of people, especially years and years ago, didn't know, songwriters, that you get to terminate your copyrights oh, after X amount of years. That's right. So you and I talk about it. And to my knowledge, and I, I'm not saying this definitively, but the next song we're sort of going to talk about Mm -hmm. was the most valued copyright ever in history because you get a multiple and can i say what the multiple was it's like 51 it or was something. a 51 times <laughs> but who's, who's thinking i mean but here's my story i'm going to tell on jim peter so we're always going to dc and this is some special event we have a songwriters caucus which is a philosophically like-minded group of lawmakers who are predisposed to help out the songwriters. Um, and this one was, we have a House Caucus and a Senate Caucus, and the co-chairs at the time were then House member Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee and Austin, Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett. What was so special about this, there's no really good place to play on Capitol Hill. You can't even play live music in the Senate. There's one great room in the House of Representatives in the Cannon Building, the Cannon Caucus Room. Mm -hmm. It's all the grandeur that you think Capitol Hill should be. It's a massive room, probably holds six or 700 people. And we, we never can get it. I think we ended up getting it twice and we get it this time. We got the Cannon Caucus Room. I got to call Peter. And hey. we rolled out the A-team. I think Jeffrey Steele was there, Chuck Cannon. There were five or six writers and we, we did it weirdly. We didn't do an, a round. The four or five other writers were standing behind single microphones playing two or three of their biggest hits. And we're going to bring you on at the end. And people don't know that you're either going to be there. Okay? And it's packed. And there's 600 congressional staffers. And it's hard to keep them quiet. But we, we do this thing. And we get through the first three songs. And the second, I'm like, where the hell is Jim? <laughs> I'm like, where's Peter? And you've disappeared. So I send, send one staff person out. Uh, this is like finding the three little pigs, man. And and you're, you're nowhere. And I'm like, go check the bathrooms, maybe. Go go upstairs, go downstairs. We're on the last guy, the last song. Literally fades out. And I'm got, I got to walk up here. No, we did tell everybody you were playing. And I got to announce to the crowd, Peter X disappeared. Now, not much of an exaggeration. These doors in that room... 15, 20 feet tall. They were huge. They look like the doors to the gates of heaven. They're massive. And it's all I can do. And I'm a pretty stout guy to open one of those things. And they're closed. I still don't know. And I don't know. You've never told me. Tom, they open. Both of them just open. And you hear the first refrain. We're not going to play it. We're going to end with this of the, the famous song that we're going to talk about. Well, I'll, I'll play it. Don't. Dump, dump, dump. And Peter is like walking all over the place. And he goes up to every single member of Congress that he'd met, because you'd been on office appointments for two or three days with me. Blackburn's got the eye of the tiger. Lloyd Dog has got the You've got so many votes. You go to the middle of the room, unamplified, and 600 congressmen, congresswomen, and congressional staffers move around. You got me a lot of votes, Jimbo. So, <laughs> My this, whole thing, <laughs> this whole thing starts. If there's any kids on here, they probably never don't even know what an 
answering machine is. <laughs> but you get a voicemail on an answering machine. Yeah. So take it yeah. from there. Well, I, I pulled up with my uh, my Toyota. I was really low key. I I made a lot of money, but my Berwyn roots. I was still driving a Toyota, and I remember meeting uh, Bob Seeger at, at a session. He was cutting one of his smashes, and a v, uh, Eye of the Tiger just came out, and he said, uh, uh, "So, uh, what are you driving?" I said, "A Toyota." He says, "A Toyota? You should be driving a, a Ferrari, man!" You know, and I said, "Well, I guess you're right, but it's pretty cool." He said, "Yeah, it's pretty cool." But that, that's that's uh, the way I am. You know, I've changed a little now. I got a Lamborghini. So anyway, and a few classic cars, 55 Chevy convertible, 58 Corvette convertible. So I'm, I'm starting to loosen up a little bit, you know. Let me let me interrupt. 55 Chevy? Yeah, man. That and those Anglicas from like the 40s are my favorite two classic cars. What color is yours? It's, it's orangey red and cream. Oh my God! You got to drive that to Nash Vegas when this is over. I can uh, just see right. me and you up and down Music Row. Uh, yeah. I'll drive and you play I all uh, the way up and down Sixteenth uh, uh, Avenue. All it's right? a deal. It's a deal. So where were we? I forgot. You get this voicemail. Oh yeah, the, the answer machine. So yeah, I'm sorting mail. I, I press play, and it was a uh, message from my sister, a message from my buddy Steve, and then I hear, "Hey, yo, Jim." That's a nice answering machine you got there. It's Sylvester Stallone, give me a call. And I, this is a joke. This is a joke. That's not Stallone. It, he would, he would have a secretary. He would. Have, oh, at know. this time, he's arguably the biggest star on the planet. The biggest star on the planet. So I, I just ignore it, and I, I listen to a few more messages, and and Karen, little Miss Kulat, says, uh, "Who was that?" I said, "Oh, some joker pretending to be Stallone." He goes, she goes, let me hear that. Hey, yo, Jim, that's a nice answer machine you got there. Give me a call. A, she goes, you better call it back, you know. Okay, okay. Well, it was a 312, uh, uh, a 213 area code. That was a good start. So I, I dialed the number, and I, and I hear, yo. I said, well, that's a good sign. Instead of hi, he goes, yo. I like that. So I said, uh, this is Jim Peterick. Is this really Sylvester Stallone? Hey, hey Jimbo, call me Sly. You know, here I am, kid from Burrow, and I'm calling my hero Sly. So I said, hi, Sly, what's going on? He says, well, look, I just talked to Tony Scotty, you know, the head of your label. He played me some stuff from your second album, second Survivor album, and there's a song called Poor Man's Son. And a couple others, he said, that's the sound I want. I love that singer, that Dave Bickler. And I want that gritty sound. I need a new song for Rocky III. That's a, I'm filming that right now. He said, I don't want to use Gonna Fly now. That's a nice song, you know, but it's, you know, that's, that's yesterday. I, I want something for the kids, something with a pulse. Can you help me out? And I said, is the Pope Catholic? You know, he, oh, that's funny. You know. So uh, he said, I'll tell you what I, I'm going to do. I'm going to send you first three minutes of the movie, because that's the montage that I need you to write this great song. Two days later, the, the big uh, Betamax comes. We read a, a Betamax Pro, put it on, a, on the kitchen counter, and I, I invited Frankie Sullivan over, the guitar player from Survivor. Wait, you didn't even did you have a Betamax? No, we rented one. <laughs> we rented it. They're like brand new. It was a, a Betamax Pro. It was huge. So we put it in. And we see Mr. T rising up, looking fierce. And Stallone's doing Master Charge commercials, you well, know. Let's back up one quick second. Yeah. They didn't want to give you the movie, did they? <laughs> they what? They didn't want to give you a copy of the movie, did they? No, no. They sent us the first three minutes only. So we watch it. First, what was really unusual is that we're supposed to write a song for the first three minutes. But in the background to the action, you hear bomb, bomb, bomb. Another one bites the dust, bah, and another one go. I'm looking at Frankie going, what the hell? They got a song. Call up S Sylvester. Sly, dude, Peterick. By this time, I'm you know, first name basis. You got a song. Uh, another one bites the dust by Queen. He goes, oh, yeah, couldn't get the publishing rights. Thank you, Queen. Thank you, Freddie, baby. Okay. He said, no, I need you to write a song for that first three minutes. Okay. So, you know, I had a little thing where it started going, you know, like that. I had my guitar around my neck, just like that, you know. 
and that felt pretty good. And I was looking at the punches, and I was going. Wait for a punch. Screws up the drummer. So we had that, but we couldn't get any further, man. I wrote that intro. It's like, there's the song, but we needed words. So I called up Stallone and, and begrudgingly, he sent us the whole movie. That He wasn't supposed to do that. You got to send it back the next day because I'll get in big trouble, you know. So he sent us the full length movie and that's when it all made sense. And that's when we hear Mickey, the, the trainer going, Rocky, you're losing the eye of the tiger. Eye of the tiger, I look at Franco's, there's our title. And the next three days I'm jogging around the neighborhood, writing down lyrics, furiously rising up back on the street Frankie actually came up with the first seed lyric. He goes, back on the street, doing time, taking chances. I said, how about this, Frank? Rising up, back on the street, did my time, took my chances. Went the distance, now I'm back on my feet. Just a man and his will to survive. <laughs> and we were off and running, baby. We went into the studio. Uh, we rounded up Survivor, you know, Stefan and, and Mark and everybody. Dave Bickler, we went down to the uh, Chicago Recording Company, and like I said with that other song, take two, we caught lightning in a bottle, I got goosebumps. I said, we didn't just record a song, we, we're making history here, guys. And uh, well, it, it turned out it, that it pretty much was true. Sent, sent a rough mix that Frankie did to Stallone, he says, you guys really did it, but you got a little lazy on me. You didn't write me a third verse. And I busted. So I, I repeated the first, I had Dave repeat the first verse in the third, uh, third chorus, um, uh, third verse rather. So I said, okay, okay. So we took the first verse and I exchanged some lyrics. Instead of rising up back on the street, it was rising up straight to the top. And I did some funny business. We redid the vocal and, that, and Stallone says, you got it. This is going to outlive you and me. And all of a sudden, we're on the red carpet in, in, in Hollywood for the premiere. And, but you know what, uh, Bart and, and Tom, it really wasn't until I snuck into my local theater and I saw those people stand up in the, when that song came on that I knew we had a smash record. Uh, we were on the road and uh, another event came. I was eating in a pizza hut and on the jukebox, I had the tiger. This is the first week it was out. And this little girl, Gets on the dance floor, starts twirling around. Daddy, daddy, they're playing my song. <laughs> and that was better than any Hollywood red carpet. That's when I knew we had a, a major hit. Well, it's one of the most recognizable songs in the annals of music history. Thank you, Who Knew. Thank you, Tom. Love you, Jimbo. Hope we can do Tin Pan. We're going to do it the week before Thanksgiving next year. Uh, Take us home. All right. Going to do it. Thank you, guys. Tom, Tom Bart, uh, Bart, you guys are the best. And uh, on behalf of me and Larry and my whole family, this is for you. Screw that up. One, two, one, two, three, four. Oh. Wait for the drummer. Hanging tough, staying hungry. 
they stack the ice, still they take to the street. For the kill with the steel to survive. It's the eye of the tiger, it's the thrill of the fight. Rising up to the challenge of our rival. And the last no survivor starts to pray in the night. And he's watching us all with the eyes. The eye of the tiger. So you want another verse, us? Sly, you want another verse? All right, you got it. Ooh, rising up, straight to the top. Had the guts, got the glory. Cool, huh? With the distance, now I'm not going to stop. Just a man and his will to survive. It's the eye of the tiger, it's the thrill of the fight. Rising up to the challenge of our rise. smiled this much in 2020. <laughs> Thank you so much. My Bart, pleasure, Tom. Art, you are a rock star, but Jim, you are an absolute treasure. Thank you so much for sharing your stories, your wisdom. We're all inspired and keep creating fantastic songs, please. I'm, I'm going to do it. Can't stop me. Right on. That's it, guys. I got nothing more to say. Thanks, everybody that tuned in, man. Had a blast. Had a blast. Right on. All right. Stay safe. You too.